The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for five minutes. Did the FBI pay Christopher Steele, and was the dossier the basis for securing warrants at the FISA court to spy on Americans associated with the Trump campaign? Really, when you sum it all up, it boils, it boils down to those fundamental questions. Did you pay the guy who wrote it? And did you use what he wrote, disproven, discredited dossier paid for by the Clinton campaign? Did you use it to go get warrants to spy on Americans? That's what it comes down to. And you're the guy who can answer those questions. And I was yesterday I was convinced that the answer to those questions was probably yes. But today, I'm even more convinced the answer is yes, based on the text messages we got to read early this morning. Mr. Rosenstein, you know Peter Strzok, you familiar with that name? I, yes, I'm familiar with the name. And, or, uh, former I'm Deputy Head of Counterintelligence at the FBI. Peter Strzok, that one? I, I don't know his precise title, but yes, he had a significant role in- Peter Strzok ran the Clinton campaign, interviewed Mills, Abedee, and Clinton, changed the exoneration letter from gross negligence to extreme carelessness. Peter Strzok, who ran the Russian investigation, interviewed Mike Flynn. Peter Strzok selected by Mr. Mueller to be on his team. That Peter Strzok, we learned, had all these text messages. We got to read some of them early this morning. Now, as, as my colleagues have pointed out, some of them are, you know, they show he didn't like Trump. He and Ms. Page are exchanging text messages back and forth, show they don't like the president. But that's nothing new. Everyone on Mueller's team, no one on Mueller's team likes Trump. We already knew that. But I want to focus on one in particular. One in particular. And this, uh, this is a text message from Mr. Strzok to Ms. Page recalling a conversation and a meeting that took place in Andy, uh, Andrew McCabe's office, deputy director of the FBI, recalling a meeting earlier. And Mr. Strzok says this, I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office. Then there's a break. Dash, it says that there's no way he gets elected, no way Trump gets elected. He says, I want to believe that. You said that in the meeting in Andrew McCabe's office. I want to believe that. But then he goes, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. Now, this goes to intent. He says, we can't take the risk. At, you know, the people of this great country might elect Donald Trump president. We can't take this risk. This is Peter Strzok, head of counterintelligence at the FBI. This is Peter Strzok, who I think had a hand in that dossier that was all dressed up and taken to the FISA court. He's saying, we can't take the risk. We have to do something about it. Now, don't forget the timeline here either, Mr. Rosenstein. Peter Strzok, January 10th, he's the guy who changes the exoneration letter from gross negligence, criminal standard, to extreme carelessness. July 2nd, he's the guy who sets in on the Clinton interview. July 5th, 2016, that's when Comey has the press conference and says, we're not going to prosecute. Clinton's okay. We're not going to prosecute. And then August 2016, we have this text message, the same month that the Russian investigation is opened at the FBI, August 2016. And my guess is that's the same month that the application was taken to the FISA court to get the warrants to spy on Americans. Using this dossier that the Clinton campaign paid for, Democrats paid for, fake news, all dressed up, taken to the court. So I got really just a couple basic questions. Because it seems to me if the answer to any of, these, of those two questions, if the answer is yes, if you guys paid Christopher Steele, at the same time the Democrats in the Clinton campaign were painting, or if you took the dossier, dressed it all up, took it to the FISA court, and used that as the basis to get warrants, and now we have intent in this, in this text message saying, that, there's another text message, my colleague referenced it earlier, where Mr. Strzok says, I can protect our country at many levels. He says it with all the humility he could muster. I can protect our country at many levels. This guy thought he was super agent James Bond at the FBI. This is obvious. I'm afraid we can't take that risk. We can't, there's no way we can let the American people make Donald Trump the next president. I gotta protect our country. This is unbelievable. And I'm here to tell you, Mr. Rosenstein, I think the public trust in this whole thing is gone. So it seems to me you got two things you can do. You're the guy in charge. You're the guy who picked Mueller. You're the guy who wrote the memo saying why he needed to fire Comey. You're the guy in charge. You could disband the Mueller special prosecutor, and you can do what we've all called for, appoint a second special counsel to look into this, to look into Peter Strzok, Bruce Orr, everything else we've learned in the last several weeks. Yes, Congressman, and uh, I can assure you that I consider it very important to make sure the thorough review is done. 
uh, and our inspector general is doing a thorough review. That's how we found those text messages as part of that review. Let me, you've, you've given that answer like 15 times. Let me ask you this. Are you concerned, I mean, this is what a lot of Americans are believing right now, and I certainly do, that the Comey FBI and the Obama Justice Department worked with one campaign to go after the other campaign. That's what everything points to. Think about what we've learned in the last several weeks. We, we first learned they paid for the dossier, then we learned about Peter Strzok, and last week we learned about Bruce Orr and his wife, Nellie. I mean, this is unbelievable. So what's it going to take to get a second special counsel to answer these questions and find out, was Peter Strzok really up to what I think he was? I, I think it's important to understand, Congressman, we have an inspector general who has 500 employees and a $100 million budget, uh, and this is what he does. He investigates allegations of misconduct involving department employees. That review that he is conducting is what turned up those text messages. It will also involve interviews of those persons and of other witnesses. And we're looking forward to his report, and we've met with Mr. Horowitz, and we're anxiously awaiting that report. But that doesn't dismiss the fact that the country thinks we need a second special counsel. 20 members of this committee, the Judiciary Committee, with primary jurisdiction over the Justice Department, thinks we need a second special counsel. All kinds of senators think we need a special counsel. <coughs> What fact pattern do you have to have? What kind of text message do you have to see before you say it's time for a second special counsel? I want to assure you, Congressman, as I think the Attorney General explained, we take very seriously the concerns of 20 members of this committee or one member of this committee, but we have a responsibility to make an independent determination, and we will. Uh, thank the Chair. The Chair recognizes the, the, chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Thank you for being here. Uh, uh, just so it's clear, I'm one of the uh, numerous members of the Judiciary Committee that have asked for a second special prosecutor uh, based on uh, what Mr. Jordan earlier said. Uh, the Justice Department is responsible for investigating criminal conduct. Would that include criminal conduct by the NSA? Yes. Okay. Uh, we all learned uh, under the prison uh, that was happening years ago by the NSA that the NSA was doing, uh, in my opinion, unconstitutional surveillance on Americans and their emails by tracking it and hacking in to see those emails uh, came to light under Snowden, uh, after Snowden, uh, uh, who I care nothing for, uh, brought that to America's attention. The uh, NSA said, we're not going to do that anymore, uh, the, uh, which I think is appropriate because I thought it was unconstitutional. And uh, we've, we've heard reports through the media that there has been unmasking of uh, information. What I, what I mean by that is uh, it, classified information is seized uh, on somebody and someone else, an American, uh, that their name is caught up in the uh, communication. And if someone leaks who that was, unmask that individual, my understanding is if it's classified information, whoever does that unmasking has committed a felony. Uh, is that correct? The only <clears throat> distinction I would make, Congressman, is the unmasking typically is something done uh, in the course of the intelligence analysis. The leaking would be a violation. That's what I'm talking about, the leaking of of that information. And uh, as of today, uh, has anybody been indicted under PRISM? Has anybody been indicted under leaking information on, on unmasking up until today? Has the Justice Department indicted anybody under those two uh, uh, scenarios and events? We have indicted, uh, prosecuted people for leaking uh, I'm not certain whether, I, I don't believe any of them related to unmasking. So no one's been indicted, uh, to your knowledge. Which, uh, I want to bring up now the uh, uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that has been discussed by this committee uh, numerous times. Uh, it's the, uh, the law that allows secret courts to issue secret warrants to try to go get uh, terrorists that are operating overseas and get their information. Uh, do, does the Justice Department present those FISA warrants to a FISA judge? In situations where a warrant is required, yes, it needs to be obtained from a federal judge. That's right. But the Justice Department is responsible for that. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, also under uh, 
FISA, uh, once again, Americans are, are brought into the scenario because you target a foreign terrorist and then you go after their emails and then you find emails of Americans and those are inadvertently uh, caught in the, the, uh, the surveillance of the target. According to the Washington Post recently, 90% of those inadvertent emails are on Americans. And my question to you is, has, why hasn't the uh, Justice Department, the FBI, the intelligence community presented to Congress and our request that took place years ago, how many of those inadvertent emails, communications, text messages, conversations have been on Americans? We have been asked for the number. Do you know why that has not uh, been brought to our attention? And let me just follow up with this reason. Here's the reason we need it. We're getting ready to re maybe reauthorize 702, which I have a lot of problems with. I think it's unconstitutional in many other ways. But beside the point, here we are at a deadline getting ready to reauthorize it, and still the intelligence community refuses to tell us how many Americans' um, information has been seized. Can you tell us? why we haven't gotten that information that we've asked for for years. No, I testified at a hearing with Director Coates, uh, who I think would be a more appropriate person to answer that because he has access to the data and he's, he has explained it. Uh, but I, I would simply point out that you use the term inadvertent. It's the term that we use is incidental. If you're incidental, I don't mind the problem, the name of the change. My point is simply if you're investigating a foreign terrorist, knowing with whom that person is communicating may be relevant to your investigation. And so it's not- That's not my question. My question was, <clears throat> we're getting ready to maybe reauthorize 702. I don't think we ought to reauthorize it until we find out from the intelligence community where there are no indictments that have been issued against the intelligence community based upon the statements that you have made to see whether or not they're violating the law and they refuse to give this committee the information about how many people have been caught up in that uh, and we've been, it's been stonewalled by the intelligence community saying, well, we just can't, can't do it. Why can't the uh, intelligence community get some geek over at uh, Best Buy and have them come in and answer that question with a few little taps into the big computer system? We just want the number. The time of the gentleman has expired. The witness may answer the question. As I explained, Congressman, I've heard Director Coates explain this, and uh, uh, he's better positioned than I. <laughs> so we don't know. Still don't know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.